Okay, good evening, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Let me know if you guys can hear my audio and see my screen in the chat box. Just give me a little why or yes there. Hope everybody's having a fantastic evening so far. And just also want to give a shout out and a warm welcome to anybody that's new with us in the program. Excited to have you guys here. And um, if you are new to the program, um, if it's your first time or second time or doesn't matter if this has been your hundredth time, uh, let us know um, um, what questions you have and uh, let us know where you're from. If you are new, like tell us your state, where you're from, and or if it's a country, let us know what country you're from. But excited to be here, guys. Um, um, and yeah, it's good to be here, uh, William, Bill. Good to see you. Excited to see everybody. So let's jump into this. Um, before we get started, as always, I need to remind you guys about the risks involved in the market. You can lose all or more than your initial investment if you're not careful. So please be aware of how many pips you're risking on each trade in addition to how big your lot size is and ultimately how that would affect your account if you were to lose money. Okay. All right, guys. So let's talk about... Um, Let's see. I want to make sure I explain what the COT report is um, just for those that are new, because I want to make sure that like this specific webinar, because we talk about the COT report throughout the week, this specific webinar, I want to make sure that we go through the details, like why it works, what it is, how you can implement it, and then ultimately lead up to how it's a strategy and how you can ultimately use it. And then other questions that you guys may have. So I think we'll start there. And then the last thing that we'll do is we'll take a look at this week's results. We've kind of already updated some of those results. Um, some of you have already, um, I mean, a lot of you have been trading it with me this week. We've had some good trades and we've also had some rough trades this week. And 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 also some not so rough trades. So it's been kind of a mixed bag, but overall it has been a profitable week so far. Um, so we'll definitely dive into that towards the end, just kind of going over the details midweek here. Um, but the first thing I want to do is make sure that everyone's on the same page. So for some of you, this is old hat, um, but I want to make sure that the new guys really get a good grip here. So first of all, let's explain what the COT report is. So the COT report stands for Commitment of Traders, and it is a report that the government creates, okay? So the U.S. government. Um, here in the United States, for those of you that are international, we have an organization. It's a branch of our government. We call it the CFTC. It's the Commodities, Futures, and Trading Commission. Okay, these guys are in charge of regulating the commodities and futures market. Okay, and as one of their functions that they have is to analyze and create data um, and analysis on on the on the uh, uh, commodities and futures market. Okay, um, so so that's where that's where the cot report comes in so one of the specific and i would even argue the most popular um data components that they release every week is the cot report and it stands for commitment of traders and the reason why it's called commitment of traders is because um the people that report to the cot report so there's a bunch of banks that are on exchanges like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. These these banks and hedge funds they have to register to these exchanges. These exchanges then have to report back to the CFTC. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, line of command of how this works. Okay, so think about think of it this way. Banks who trade the free market is out there doing what they do, making money, having fun. They're on a specific exchange where they make uh, things possible. The buyers and sellers come together at the market. That's the marketplace is the exchange. The exchange then has to report what's been going down at these marketplaces. And then they then tell that to the guys in charge or the regulators, uh, which is the CFTC, okay? That's kind of what you're looking at. Now, here's where the commitment of traders is really interesting. So the COT report basically tells us what transactions took place the previous week, okay? 
So if we can get a, a glimpse of what the banks have been buying versus what they've been selling, that could be very useful information because these guys are typically pretty good at what they do. They're good traders. They make money. They wouldn't be doing what they do and they wouldn't be in business very long unless they were able to make money in the markets. Okay. So when people talk about trading with the banks, this is this is probably, in my opinion, the best way to do it because you're not just trading some candlestick that you think maybe, you know, when you look at the charts, you're not really just, you know, you're kind of guessing when you're just looking at technical analysis, not all the time, but I mean, you're guessing on anything, right? Like anything's a guess, right? But um, I think the best guess you can possibly make would be to actually see what the the banks are actually up to and, and purchasing when they're purchasing and selling when they're selling, right? Um, that's where the COT report is really, really cool. Okay, so you get an in-depth look to see what they're buying and what they're selling throughout the week, and that can influence us and what we trade into the next week, right? So um, this is the cftc.gov homepage right here, and they've got this ribbon up here where you can look up this information, right? So they've got a lot of stuff you can look at. Where I find the COT report is right here where it says market data and economic analysis, you come down in the drop down to commitment of traders. You click on that for COT, and this is the COT page. And the COT page has all sorts of stuff. Like you've got all these different types of reports. This report right here in the futures market, you've got legacy reports um, on the different exchanges, and there's a lot to look at. Okay. Um, and a lot of it will tell you the same information, some of it is different. And um, there's different parties. So like when you're on an exchange, there's some people who register to the exchange and they're like, let's say they're just there to offset, uh, like for example, the commercial side of the market, they trade Forex, but they do it to offset potential losses on um on their products and services that they're selling. So um, believe it or not, places like Walmart and Target and Costco, they have their own foreign exchange department, which sounds crazy, right? But they but they do. Um, I actually, when I was going to school and studying for my degree, I got to tour with the finance club that I was in. I got to tour a company that didn't sell any products. It was just services, an international company. And they they actually had uh, a team of three guys uh, who basically bought and sold currencies in different countries to offset, um, uh, to basically offset their business transactions that they were uh, operating um, in these different countries. So an example of this is like, if you think um, like if you're if you're going to start a big project in another country um, and you think that that country's currency um, might go down in the coming months, but you have to front load uh, a deposit on a project that you're about to purchase and it's millions of dollars, you know, you could potentially lose a lot of money um, if if uh, that currency becomes worthless later. OK, Um Right. And if and if you have holdings in currency in different countries, let's say you have a your company has bank accounts in a lot of different countries, uh, you you could potentially uh, lose uh, money if if that money was just sitting there and not doing anything. Right. And so that's where these foreign exchange companies come in and they or these these commercial companies come in and they try to offset that. They're not technically speculators. They're not like you and I who are just trying to make a buck or two, right? They're just trying to do what they do. And often they're on the wrong side of the market, believe it or not. So, and they do it again to offset they their hedge funds, right? They, they well, they're not just hedge funds. They're, they're commercial hedge, hedge funds with the sole purpose of just offsetting and balancing out their books. That's all it's for. The people we want to follow are the large speculators. These are people who are um, 
basically taking outright positions in the markets, right? So I'm going to show you where you can find this information. So I often look at this long format in the financial futures market to find where the speculators are. There's also the short format of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's another common place to go to see uh, what the big guys are doing, okay? So I'm going to pull up the report so you can see it. So if I click on this right here, it's going to pull up the most recent report. Okay. And it's super boring, guys. It is so boring and it's ugly. But these guys, the CFTC has been releasing COT report data in the way that they've been releasing it uh, since 2005. Uh, there's been COT reports um, that have been created not necessarily by the CFTC, but by other organizations and other regulatory authorities um, for many, many decades. But the history of the COT report in the way we know of it today has been coming out pretty much nonstop every week since 2005. So it's been you know over tw uh, almost 20 years, right? But this is what a COT report looks like. So you'll you'll see up here at the top what it is. It says traders and financial futures, right? Um, and then it says as of May 16th, 2023. Okay. Um, you'll notice when you look at these dates, they're always going to be dated um, the previous Tuesday. Um, well, not necessarily the previous Tuesday. It's the last week's Tuesday. Okay. Um, why is it dated on a Tuesday? Um, the reason why it's dated Tuesday is because that is when those marketplaces, those exchanges I was talking about, they have to gather up the information that's taken place in the last week. So, you know, you have uh, banks who are who have been buying and selling uh, throughout the week, um, and they have to report on their books what they own what they've bought, what they currently own, all of this. And it's reported in a very neat and organized way to the CF or to the exchange. And then the exchange takes all this information, sums it up, organizes it. And then they just say, okay, here you go, CFTC. Here is the information. Here are, is our statistics for the last week. They're like, thanks so much. Um, they take that information. And then over the next three days, between Tuesday and Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, the COT report is then released to the public and and to other, well, anybody like the us uh, banks they they have access to it, um, and uh, and essentially that's what the COT the COT report is. Okay, um, so it does it's a little bit lack. So I had a I had a guy ask me. Um, I don't know if he's here today. I don't, no, I don't see him, but. Um, he asked me this weekend, um, why is the COT report dated 516? Uh, you know, that that seems a while ago because today's 524, right? Is there one that's sooner? And it's always the previous Tuesday. So if you look at this calendar here, um, there was um, um, yesterday, Tuesday, but we don't have the report from yesterday because the report from yesterday is going to come out this Friday. Um, I think it should. I don't think Memorial Day is going to mess that up. It, it could, but I don't think so because Memorial Day is next week, uh, which, by the way, that could actually affect the COT report for just so everybody knows. I'm sure I'm going to have to say this a million times, but that's fine. That's totally fine. So historically, when you get a COT report that has a holiday, like a government holiday during the week, Sometimes that report isn't released until the following Monday. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. So next, not this week, we shouldn't have a problem this weekend. We should get it on Friday, no problem. But on, here, let me put this back up. Since we have Memorial Day on Monday, there's a chance we don't get the COT report this Friday. Friday, just so everybody knows. Okay. Oh, not, not this one, but the next one. So on June 2nd, it's possible we don't even get one. Okay. Uh, we will get it, but not on the 
you know, on t- timely 4 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Like we might not get it uh, until Monday. It, it, I mean, it could come out on a Saturday or Sunday. I doubt it. I don't think the government does anything on the weekend. So I'm pretty sure it's going to come out Monday. I've seen that happen a couple of times. Um, we might get an announcement from the CFTC. So we'll take a close look um, to see when we'll get it. If that's the case, then we'll just simply have to wait until we get it. And then we'll just go quickly. Like we'll get the setup. We'll analyze the data and I'll publish the results is like very quickly. So we'll just need to see when that comes out and then we'll go ahead and take those trades. Anyway, that's not this weekend. I just wanted to let you guys know that there's, I would say if I had a bird percentage, probably 70%, like I've seen it happen before. It's a pretty good chance that we don't even get the gut report on the second. It'll come out the following Monday. So just be aware of that, that, that that's a thing. Okay. This week we should be good though. All right. So that's, that's what it is with the dates. And this throws a lot of people up, like, especially if you're doing back testing, which by the way, I recommend like everybody should do some back testing on the cut report because it's pretty fun. Like it's an easy strategy to back test because you literally just have data, right? It's not like a uh, I'm back testing some candlesticks. No, 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 no. It's not like that. It's you're just back testing this information. This to me is the best type of back testing because you're it, it's just so analytical. There's a right and a wrong answer. It, we're looking at facts here, which is really nice. Okay. Um, okay, so when I'm looking at the COT report, like I said, it's super ugly, and I've already spent a lot of time on this page, um, but I like to do a control plus on my keyboard, um, and you can zoom into it so you can see things better. And then there is a lot of stuff on here, like currencies, you've got, um, oh man, there's uh, stuff on um, like gold and silver, CFDs, there's a lot of stuff in here. So I like to do a control F and I like to search for the currency that I'm about to trade. So if I wanna trade the Aussie, I'm just gonna search AUD and that's gonna take me straight to the Aussie, which is right here, right? And I'm always looking at specifically the leverage fund side. Why do I like the leverage fund side? And this is important. A couple of reasons actually, um, Number one, if you read about it, if you read the the information about what's a dealer, what is an asset manager, what's a leveraged funds, right? When you look up this information, you'll be able to pretty much decipher when you read the inf- information on this that leveraged funds is pretty much the large speculators. These are people like you and me who get paid to make money, like just straight up. I'm going to go to work this week, find out what currency is going to be the best, find out which currency is going to be the worst. And if I can trade that, I'm going to get a bonus, right? Like I'm going to make some money, right? That's what you're supposed to do um, with leveraged funds, okay? Um, asset managers and institutional, a lot of these are like the non-commercials or the commercials, excuse me, like I was just talking about. So I wouldn't necessarily follow these guys. Um Dealers are market makers who specifically sell securities. So this is not something I would follow either. Um, If you look into the details about the dealer side, it doesn't seem to match the personality of the type of trader we want to mimic, which from, like I said, the leveraged funds seems to be the side that we want to follow, generally speaking, okay? Okay, so when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at how many are long and I'm looking at how many are short, okay? And then this right here tells me the very specifics of it. So you got 30,052 contracts long, 32,166 short. So this tells us that there are a few more traders to the short side. The banks have a little bit of a bigger position on the short side of the Aussie than they do the long side. Um, Is that significant? We'll find out once we plug it into my journal, which is the next step. Um, But it doesn't necessarily mean 
that it is or not until you plug it into the journal. Then you'll find out. But this is where the information comes from. That's where I'm just showing you how to source this yourself. Some of you are pretty good at computers. Um, I've had clients in the past who have built Excel macros where they can extract this information week to week directly onto their Excel file, which is amazing, cool, cool technology, right? Um, the next thing I like to look at is the net change. So you'll notice down here, we have the change in long positions and the change in short positions. This is useful information because if we can see that they're rapidly changing their direction, then maybe that would lead us on to a new trend change or something like that, right? So this is nice. I do document this information, but obviously I do I, I document how many positions long and short they have. But yes, we do want to see which direction they are going, which is important. Um, let me give you, let me show, I had some people ask me this question this week. What does it mean if there's a negative number here? What that means is if you have a negative change, like for example, on the short side here, there's minus 3,000, <clears> uh, minus 3,000 contracts changed on the short side. That means there's been a reduction of short positions, which means there's fewer shorts than there were the previous week. So, and that and that's all that means. It doesn't necessarily mean they added more longs. It just means on that column alone, they just decreased the amount of shorts. That's all that's telling you. Now, when you add this piece of information, it's a little more helpful because you can see that on the Aussie, they added 826 contracts to the long side. So yeah, right there confirms what we were just talking about. So they've decreased their shorts and they've subsequently added some longs. So anyways, just something to be aware of, okay? Um, okay, then I take this information and I plug it into my journal, which is right over here, okay? A lot of you guys are familiar with this. Um, and inside inside this journal, I I document this information. So right here, you can see here's what we were just looking at. Here's the Aussie thirty thousand fifty two contracts long, and then on the short side, you have fifty uh, thirty two thousand one hundred sixty six contracts short. Okay, and then I've put in a lot of information here. So there's everything's a derivative of each other. So this this information, like right here, the long percentage and the short percentage. What this is basically telling you is if of all the positions outstanding, 48% of those positions are long. And then of all the positions outstanding, nearly 52%, 51 to 52% are short positions. That's all that's trying to tell you, okay? Um, right here is the sum of all positions. So between longs and short, there's a total net contracts of 62,000 long and short. Here's the change from week to week. You guys just saw these numbers. And then the net change in contracts. So this is basically saying if you had a reduction in shorts and addition of longs like you do in this example, that's that means that the net change is, is, a, is a larger amount. So the percent net change actually this week was about 6%. Um, so there was a 6% net change in positions on the Aussie, uh, which can may or may not be significant. It just depends. Um, that does seem a little bit more significant. So maybe something to look at, but um, uh, that's all that information is telling you right there. Okay. And um, that that's, that's pretty much the COT report journal in a nutshell. So I'm basically coming in here, marking the date, which by the way, um, I made a little update to this. So there, I'm always going to put the date of the contract or the date of the COT report right here. But up here, I added this yellow area. So notice, in fact, I'm going to see if I can, yeah, can I make that Yeah, bigger? I want to make sure that this is extremely obvious for people to see. Um, yeah, let's make this obvious. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's fine. Okay. So right here, it says updated Saturday, May 20th. So if it was updated on the most recent weekend, then you know, okay, that Steve went in here. He definitely went in here and he made his update. Okay. I'm good to take these trades. But if you don't see an update in this journal, um, if you don't see it updated, um, like let's say you get to Saturday or Sunday 
and it's still showing the 20th, but here we are, you know, and it's the 27th or 28th of May. And this was updated on the 20th. Then, you know, okay, this is, these are not the signals. I shouldn't be taking these. Um, I need to wait until it's updated from the previous weekend. Okay. So that's what I'm doing right there. Um, okay. So basically what I do with this journal is we're isolating individual currencies, not currency pairs. We'll get to that in just a moment, but the whole essence of the COT report is to isolate individual currencies like the Aussie, the Euro, the Pound, the Kiwi, CAD, and so on. Okay. You're just trying to find out if I can just isolate and look at specifically, take a magnifying glass and say, hey, tell me how uh, the Aussie is doing this week. Tell me how the Euro is doing this week. Tell me how the Pound is doing, right? Then we can determine what currency pairs to trade if we know how individual currencies are performing, right? That's very helpful information, right? So when I'm looking at this, I am looking for the top performing currencies. And I'm actually also looking forward and looking towards the least performing currencies. So I'm looking for currency pairs that are not doing very well at all, okay? The reason why I'm doing this, and honestly, if you think about it, guys, this is how currency pairs were meant to be traded. Um, when I get new people, who come to the program and they come from like a stock trading platform, uh, 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 stock trading uh, uh, background, trading in pairs is like super new, right? Like, they're like, I, I don't know. I've never heard of pairs. Like what, what's a currency pair? And that's how Forex is traded, right? And it's how it should be traded if you think about it. So when you're trading in pairs, basically you're trying to buy the strongest currency and sell the weakest currency. Otherwise, you don't make money. You're going to make the most money if you can find the strongest and the weakest. Think about it. Seriously, if you find the strongest currency and you know it's the strongest and you find the weakest currency and you know it's the weakest currency and you pin those two together, that's what makes those excessive moves in the markets. Think about it, right? Like you get those big, massive uh, jerks to the upside, and big, massive moves to the downside. It's because... One is going up and the other one is going down. Thus, you're creating that parity, that, that massive exchange. That's what's going on. What you don't want to have is you don't want to have two competing currencies. So you don't want to buy like a, a currency pair that has a strong base currency and a strong quote currency. So just in case people don't know this, when you're trading in pairs, the first currency that appears in the pair is called the base. And the second currency that shows up is called the quote Okay, whenever you buy that instrument or that buy that pair, you're buying the quote, the base and you're selling the quote. Okay, if you short that instrument or that pair, you're basically selling the base and buying the quote. So you're always buying and selling something. Okay, it's important to make sure that we understand that. Okay, so, um, okay, so let's see what else did I want to um, bring up here? Um, so again, we don't want to take the best two and pin them together. That's not a good option. So for example, this week, the best option to trade is the, uh, like the, not the best option to trade, but the, the top currency this week is the Kiwi and the US dollar. Those are the two top, top, top currencies. So those are the, those are the two that are the strongest. So like trading the Kiwi against the dollar doesn't make sense to me um, because during the week, you're going to have lots of moves generally. And I'm not saying it has or will, but the idea is the, the Kiwi dollar, the Kiwi against the US dollar would be like taking the best teams in the in the conference, in the league. Let's say you're playing football or something and you're basically just having, you know, I don't know who, who's the best teams in college football, right? Like you got uh, Georgia and I don't know, Ohio State or something like that. Those are two very, 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 very good football teams, right? And if you have both of them play a game against each other, I mean, one or the other might win, 
right? You might put a bet on one and maybe that one wins, but on another night, the other one would, 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 would win, right? So what we don't want to have is um, a toss-up. We basically want to p- have a matchup where you pick the number one team and have them play the worst team. So who's the worst team this week? Well, it, it appears that the, the best team is, is the Kiwi or the dollar, um, kind of a toss-up between the two. You don't know necessarily which one, but it's either the Kiwi or the dollar. Um, honestly, I don't think if it, if it weren't for their rate statement, I think the Kiwi would have been just fine, but we had a rough go with the rate statement. Anyway, so so let's just say the dollar then. Okay, so the dollar is the top currency this week, um, and you have them play against a weak currency like the yen. What do you expect to have happen with with that currency pair? Oh, well, you're probably going to see that pair go up because you're buying the base, which is the dollar, and we know that one's strong, and you're subsequently selling the quote, which is the yen, and we know that that one's weak. So if you buy the dollar yen, that makes a lot of sense because the expectation is that that currency pair is going to just go pretty much straight up, right? I mean, there's going to be periods where currency pairs go down and 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 so on, but... um like there's not going to be like, a, it's not going to be just straight up all week. There's going to be times where it pulls back. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. So, so when I'm putting this together, historically, there's a, by the way, guys, there's so many different ways you can trade this. In fact, I don't even think I'm trading this the best way possible. I bet you in five years, the way I'm, tr- I'm going to trade the cop report might be really different different but it's going to be so much better but and so feel free to critique me like you guys can send me emails and i love getting these emails like if you find another way to trade the cot report please share that with me because i'm looking for better ways to trade all the time so should you right but this is one of my best ways to trade and so um for several years i've always traded um the cot report basically this way so you're just taking the number one currency as far as current holdings goes, and you're taking the worst currency as far as current holdings go, and you're pinning them together. Okay. Now, I don't look a ton at shift in positions, although I do want to incorporate that. It's kind of crazy that I haven't done a ton with the shift in positions. Like, I'll keep an eye on it, but um, from what I've been able to do, I, I've I've had a lot of success just taking the current holdings side. So the percent long against the percent short and just pinning those together. And I've, I've had a lot of success just doing that. Okay. Um, as you guys know, we're doing quite well this week. We, you know, obviously did very, very well uh, last week. Um, did very, very well. Um, last week was amazing, right? Uh, doing this and and obviously the results are paying off like over the last seven months um or eight months now this has made over 6264 pips um i guess it's made almost 13,000 12,855 and it's lost 6591 so the net profit is still over 6000 pips of profit that's pretty good like that's definitely pretty good right so Okay, what else did I want to say with that? Okay, so when I am then I want to finish up and start to get to the real stuff here where you actually start taking trades. So when I'm setting this up, basically what I'm doing every week is I'm taking the top currency and pinning it against the weakest currency, and then I make these top six signals over here. So right now, the the according to the count report, the best trade this week was going to be the dollar or the Kiwi yen long because that was the strongest against the weakest. So that'd be number one. Then you have NZD CAD, and then you have NZD Frank. You have, you know, you have the strongest against the three weakest right there. That makes a lot of sense, those top three. Then you have the dollar, which is also a really strong currency, and you're pinning it again, again against the weakest. So the dollar yen would make a lot of sense to buy, which I think that's been our best trade this week. Well, other than my my Mexican peso trade is is way better than that. But as far as the top six goes and off of the original way of trading the COT report that I've always traded it, um, the dollar yen has been the best trade this week. And it was actually, it came in at number four. 
as far as rankings go. So you never know which one's going to be like the best. Um, but yeah, the dollar yen has been our, our big, big trade. Um, USD CAD's also been really, really good. Um, long and USD Frank has been good low, long, by the way, somebody asked me, multiple people asked me last week, why are all these longs like for the last several weeks in a row? Why are they only longs? It's actually coincidental. I know that sounds crazy, but it is coincidental. Part of it's just because the currencies that have been strong, like the Kiwi, um, we actually had the Euro about a month ago or two was, was the strongest currency to trade. Um, the dollar, it just so happens that the currencies that have been really, really strong just have been the base currency, not the quote. And because they've been the base currency, that's why we've gone long. Okay, it is coincidental. I know it sounds crazy, but that it, we've had a lot of long positions. Now, if you go back, like you can go back into January or February, there's some shorts in here. Like here's a short right here in January. Um, got a couple shorts over here or right here. Um, here's a couple shorts right here in beginning of January uh shorts right so it is just coincidental right there just happens to be a lot of long trades but there's there's not it's not you're not always going to be going long sometimes you're going to go short just so happens that we're pretty much going long right now okay so that's what i do and then from here you're going to get these trades and then you got to place these trades so the way I've done this is I take these trades at the beginning of the week and I just hold them all week long and I put in a trailing I put on a trailing stop and just let them let them go for the whole week. Okay, so you'll get this information whether you want to come in here. You can just have this link, which by the way I'll just give this to you guys. I don't give this out. I used to give this out for free to people like on YouTube. I don't do that anymore. So I want you guys to know because you guys are members of the program, you guys get access to this, but um, I do not give this away to people um, anymore. Like I stopped doing that a couple months ago. Um, like I actually had a guy who found me on YouTube today, um, email me, not a client, email me, asked me for this. And I said, nope, not giving it to you. So this is for you guys. I just want to make sure that that's clear um, because, you know, I want to make sure I treat you guys right um, because you guys put a lot of faith in me. You've, you know, invested into this. I want to make sure that you guys get, get the right treatment. So, um, but yeah, like that guy asked for it and I said, well, you can have it, but you got to sign up. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I just, just because I don't want to just give away all this stuff for free. Um, it is valuable stuff and you guys see it as valuable. And so I just want to keep it valuable. All right. So, um, all right. So you guys can come in here and check that out, or you can always get it on telegram, which obviously again, to be in this Telegram channel right here, you have to be a subscriber. So you have to be a member of the program to be in here, um, which you guys are all members of that. If you're not, I'm going to put this link in the chat box. Um, make sure you guys join this if you're new and you just barely signed up. Um, like I know we've had a few, even just a few people sign up today, even in yesterday. So feel free to join in on this Telegram because this is where we post and update the signals right here. So, okay, awesome. So I'm going to move that over. Now, what we have to do is once you have these signals, now you have to figure out a stop loss for the week, okay? So I use just an average daily range as my stop loss. And since this strategy is completely data-based and you're just looking at information, I wanted a stop loss that's completely based off of information as well. I don't want you guys to have to pick you know, should my stop loss go here? Should my stop loss go there? Right? No, no, we're not doing that kind of stuff. We're just going to be, it's a data-driven stop loss. So you guys know I like this website over here. It's called mataf.net. I'm going to give you this link also in the chat box. I would bookmark this if I were you guys right here. And um, um, this is a, a very powerful tool. So I use this all the time. Um, They've got this volatility by day of the week right here. So for example, this is the Euro dollar. So the Euro dollar um, moves up on any given day of the week. It's going up, you know, its average daily range is 78 pips on Thursday. Um, on Fridays, it looks like it's 81 pips. If it's 
Wednesdays it's 84 pips. What I do is I basically just take the top day of the week. So that's Wednesday and that's 84 pips. So I actually make that my stop loss for the whole week. And that may sound like a lot of pips, especially for somebody who comes from a scalping background. It is. I'm not disagreeing with that fact. However, I mean, what scalp trade are you going to hold all week long, right? That's not a scalp trade anymore. That's a swing trade, right? So you need a swing trade like stop loss in order to accommodate this trade because there's going to be ebbs and flows throughout the week, right? So you have to give the market some room. Now, I haven't really done, and, and this may sound foolish and that's okay, but it's worked for me. I don't know if there's like an optimal stop loss and I, and I do think it changes on the market. So I don't know if you could ever find total, like, I don't know if you could totally optimize, but I think you could definitely make this better. I think the stop loss could use room for improvement, but as of right now, I'm very happy with the way I've done this. Um, so what I do is I just come in here and I find the average daily range, the biggest one of the week, and I make that my stop loss. So if I were trading the Euro dollar, um, and I saw this right here, 84 pips would be my stop loss on the week, okay? And then I would attach a trailing stop loss, okay? Um, if I were trading the dollar yen, so we come over here, type in the dollar yen, and you click on it, it's gonna load up here and you'll just wait a second. And here it comes, right. You'll notice the biggest day of the week looks like it's a Wednesday from its highest high to its lowest low, and it's about 149 pips. And I make that average daily range my stop loss for the week, and that seems to be quite appropriate, um, that type of stop loss. Um, if you start messing with this a lot, like for example, let's say you're like, ah, I, just need a I just need a third of an average daily range. So you might get away with it, um, not with a trailing stop though. You're going to get in trouble with a trailing stop. But if if you might be okay some weeks just doing a half of an average daily range or a third of an average daily range or a fourth, but you're going to have a lot of trades that stop out. And the whole point of the strategy is to allow trades to sit through duration. Like let them go to fruition by Friday. Let let yourself be in the market, invest all week long, and then hop out of the trade on Friday, right? Before the market closes. So, so I need to have a stop loss that's going to keep me in the trade all week, pretty much. And the only reason I want this stop loss to engage is if basically crap hits the fan, right? That kind of happened with the Kiwi dollar trades, right? So if you think about it, um, Yesterday, we had the rate statement with the Kiwi, and unfortunately, it didn't work out. And so those stopped out for me. I think they stopped out for the rest of you guys. Um, my trailing stops fortunately saved me quite a bit of money on those trades, but they still lost. Um, um, but they're there to protect you against a very large loss. So let's just put it that way. That's that's what they're for. Um. Um, so anyway, that's what you do. So you come in here and find those, I will post this to you and then you guys can take this on your own. So your job would be basically to get these signals on telegram where I post them or on the journal. And then your job is to come in here, grab the, um, stop loss. If I haven't provided it to you, you can just get it to yourself here and then just plug in the trade, the direction we're going, the trade that we want to take, put in your own lot size <clears throat> and then um, just let the trade go and have it trail throughout the week. And that's pretty much the strategy in a nutshell. We keep it very simple, very, very simple. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and Lee just brought this up here, is um, uh, the MT4 trailing stops for a lot of folks has been really messed up recently. And honestly, um, um, I don't think I explained it very well. In fact, I had problems with it too, because I took the trades both on Awanda, where I normally trade just on the web trader platform. And then I also uh, take the trades. Um, um, I also take the trades on MT4. Um, and 
you can't actually set up the trailing stop the same way on every platform. And MT4 has a slight difference. So I want to explain what that difference is. So let me actually pull up an MT4 account right here. So um, let's say, um, okay, so we know we want to buy the dollar yen, right? So here's the dollar yen. Um, let's say we get into a position. Um, let's go ahead and hit new order. Let's go ahead and buy. Um, and then I'm going to put in a stop loss and you can drag this to wherever you want. So let's say, you know, you want to have a 150 pip stop loss, something like that. Okay. You put it right there. Um, you can just drag it down wherever you want. Um, what I was doing, and this isn't going to work the way we want it to work. I mean, it can work, but not the way we want it to. So you come down here to the order and you right click and you hit trailing and then you hit custom and then you can put in your stop loss, right? So if it's 150 pips um, and they calculate it in points, uh, uh, there's 10 points in a pip. So if you're doing 150 pips, um, uh, you would want to do 1500 because there's 1500 points in 150 pips, right? If you wanted to do 100 pips, um, there's a thousand points in a hundred pips. So that's how you want to do it normally, right? And if I click okay, I now have a 50, I now have a 150 pip trailing stop, but here's the problem. Normally, and this is what I'm used to, like on the web trader platform, like with Awanda, uh, normally this is just going to trail to the upside. Like, like this trailing stop is going to come up as this market's going in our favor. Okay. The problem is it doesn't work like that in MT4. If you put a 150 tra 50 pip trailing stop into MT4, what it understands, what the software understands is this. It thinks you want to um, basically start trailing when the market gets 150 pips in your favor. So if it got 150 pips in your favor, then automatically the trailing stop will just go to break even. Like just like that, it'll drop right at break even and, but it won't do a thing. It literally will do nothing until the market moves 150 pips in your favor, which honestly kind of stinks. I hate the fact that it does that. And I looked last night, I watched tons of videos. I stayed up late. I was trying to figure out like, how, is there any other way? I couldn't find it. If you guys know any, any other way on MT4, let me know. I could not find it. So Basically, we have to accommodate and we have to do something different when you're on MT4. If you're going to do on the web trader, um, that's great. But the problem is a lot of prop firms, they only do MT4. There's no web trader. So you're kind of stuck to figure this out on MT4. So how would I do this? I have an idea. It's a solution. I'm also open to your ideas as well. Um, you could potentially start your trade with the normal stop loss like you could put you know 150 pips or 100 pips whatever it is you know let's just say 150 for this one you could put your stop loss right there that's your hard stop okay then you could do something like okay well if this trade like you can right click put trailing stop in click custom um Instead of doing 150 pips, maybe say, well, you know, if this trade got in my favor, um, maybe half of that, let's say 75 pips. So we'll put in a 750 pip, 750 point trailing stop, which is 75 pips. And then you clicked OK. Now what that means is when this trade goes 75 pips in your favor, then this the hard stop will move to break even. And then it will start to trail at that point, it'll start trailing after the market goes in your favor. Okay. But it has to go in your favor, at least to that threshold. And then it will start trailing like normal. I, I wish I could turn that off. I wish there was a setting. I couldn't find it. It bugs the crap out of me, but that's how MT4 does it. So I hope that makes sense. If not, um, this is recorded so you can come back and check it out. And I'm also open to your other questions. Um, Lee says, so the trailing stop would just be, be an arbitrary number. No, here's what I was thinking, Lee. So for those that are on MT4, I think we can still make this very specific. 
I was thinking of still using the hard stop as the normal average daily range, but I think it might be a smart idea to make the trailing stop half the average daily range. So let's say the Euro dollar has a hundred pip hard stop, maybe do a 50 pip trailing. That's my best idea. Um, I think that will work um, pretty well and it will limit the amount of risk that you're taking, um, but it'll mostly keep you in the trade and it'll be pretty close to what I'm doing on the web trader. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad that I'm glad you got it. That's kind of my thought. So for example, this trade actually just a second ago moved into profit, just barely, actually it just barely did there. Um, and it hasn't moved. And again, basically this market has to go in our favor, you know, at least 75 pips or whatever it was before it will go to break even. And then it will start to trail like a normal trailing stop will. Yep, and it'll minimize losses. Yep, that's what we have to do. So that's what I'm thinking is, for those of you on MT4, I'm just going to repeat that again. Put in the normal hard stop as the average daily range. And then when you go in to place the trailing stop, just right-click, click trailing, custom, and then make the trailing stop half of the average daily range. I think that will do just fine. Okay. All right, guys. So that's what we're going to do. Um, going forward, uh, I saw another question. Uh, Zena says, um, would you take the trades after Wednesday? Um, I would, so only if you're just trying to get practice. Um, I wouldn't take them in a live account um, if I missed them at this point. Um, the trades are starting to get a little old and we've actually already made some good profits on some of them. Um, so and I, I don't know how much further these will go. Maybe they go in our favor a lot more. Maybe they don't. I have no idea. Um, if you're just trying to get practice so that you can prepare to do a live account, I would recommend that. Put it in a demo. And then maybe next week, go live um, if, if you want to go live. Um, and again, just as a reminder, if you guys are going to go live, make sure that you're committed to do this for several weeks because we do have losing weeks. You know, I'm not God, right? We we do have losing weeks with this strategy. And so, you know, I don't if 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 you're gonna try it out for a week and then decide, oh, okay, if it works out this week, then that then I'll do it next week. You know, you won't be trading the cot report very long if that's the mentality. So the mentality needs to be at least give it, I would say four weeks. So because in four weeks' time, you're gonna have plenty of winning trades and winning weeks. Um, and you're also going to have a losing week or two. And so you can kind of experience both. So I would say if you're going to do the uh, COT report, you need to give it at least a month of commitment. So awesome. And then last thing I was going to do is just kind of update you on where we're at with the trades so far this week. Um, I've already updated the um uh I've already stopped out on the Kiwi trades as you guys know and I lost 23 on the NZD yen minus 52 on the NZD CAD minus 67 on the NZD franc but I want to see where we're at right now on the rest of these trades so on the USD yen wow I'm up 194 right now guys um on the USD CAD I'm up 110. That's awesome. USD franc, I'm up. Okay, this one came down a little bit, but I'm up 73. So even with my trailing stop losers, so I've had three losers of the six trades, the normal original trades. Um, I'm still up 235 pips on the week, which is amazing. That is, that's pretty outstanding in my opinion. Like that just goes to show the resiliency of the strategy, even though um, there's been some losers. Now, again, there's still tonight, um, Thursday and Friday. So who knows that this could all change, right? We're still, we still have a few more days to go, but so far so good. All right, guys. So I think that pretty well explains it. Um, 
obviously we'll meet again tomorrow. Um, just so everybody knows, Monday, I'm not doing any webinars at all for Memorial Day. And uh, I'm not doing any on Tuesday next week. So just so everybody knows. Um, but we will have our normal class tomorrow morning and on Friday. So just, just so everybody's aware. All right, guys, really appreciate your attendance tonight. Thanks for coming, especially for those of you that spent two hours with me. That's so awesome. Thanks for doing that. I hope this was valuable to you guys. Have a fantastic evening and we'll catch you in the next webinar.